Hi, welcome. My name is Dion Rossiter. I'm the executive director of Science at Cal. And Science at Cal supports the advancement of the public's understanding of science and technology by creating opportunities for the UC Berkeley STEM research community to share the wonder and the excitement and the relevance of their research with the public. So because of the coronavirus and all of the rules and regulations in place to keep everyone at home, we have now moved all of our programming online as a, many other programs have done as well. So instead of having live lectures, we're actually bringing the scientists to you via these videos. So I have with me today, Pro Professor Glonsinger, who runs a virology lab in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. So welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. So we are just going to go ahead and get started. I mean, first, before we get into the science, how are you doing? I'm doing as well as could be done under the circumstances. Yeah, it's, it's hectic and stressful for everyone, but it's pretty remarkable how everybody pulls together under these circumstances. Yeah, it really has been. It's felt very much like a community effort, both in the public and the scientific community, I'm sure, and um, healthcare workers and everybody on the front lines. So thank you also for being here, but also making sure that, you know, the science that's going on in your lab is, is happening and reaching the public. So tell us a little bit more about your lab and what it specializes in and what you do broadly. Yeah, sure. So I'm a virologist, which is basically the term that one would use for a scientist that studies viruses and specializes in viruses. And I have studied viruses my entire career. I've been at Cal for about 14 years now. And my lab uh, in general is really interested in how it is that viruses, once they're in a cell, are able to take over and steal the cellular machinery and basically convert that cell into a factory that produces more viruses. And we specialize in herpes viruses actually. Um, and we also specialize in how it is that these, and to some extent other viruses too, are able to get their own genes expressed. Uh, and so that's, that's mostly what we work on. Great. So what has the lab-based response been um, on campus, both within your lab and the other labs on campus? Um, and how is your lab contributing to that response? Yeah, so the response has been um, really multifaceted, I would say. Um, of course, the shelter in place um, order and directives has influenced all of the laboratory research on campus. Uh, the, the primary concern has been the safety of the students and the staff. And so the vast majority of those um, research efforts have had to have been uh, wound down basically in response to the shelter in place so that we make sure we're complying with, with public safety and um, public health measures as well. That said, of course, um, labs that are able to directly contribute to studying responses and, and antivirals and screening and things like that for the current pandemic are up and running and working pretty much day and night in many cases to try and come up with uh, ideas and strategies to, to be able to fight this current outbreak. And so um, from my lab's perspective, that, that involves um, both trying to you know, intellectually come up with things to volunteer uh, their efforts where they might be needed for, for um, screening efforts and other sorts of things that are ongoing across campus, as well as um, getting ready to start some projects that are focused towards understanding how this virus causes disease. Yeah, one of the things that we've asked our community to do is send us questions so we can start answering questions that people have um, in terms of just virus science and, um, and, and those sorts, you know, all the general questions. And so one of the questions people have is really, how does a virus even take over a cell to replicate itself? Um, how does the coronavirus do this? So if you could just explain that for the, for the folks watching. Sure. I can just explain it in general for viruses and coronaviruses like this COVID-2 will behave pretty similarly to this general explanation. So the coronavirus and all other viruses, what they need to do is figure out how to get into a cell, right? Your cell is like a protective coating around your genome, which is the instructions for life. 
And a virus wants to figure out or needs to figure out how to get past that protective coating, that house that's, uh, that's around your genome. And so it uses a specialized strategy in which it's got on its surface something that you can think of almost as like a key, a master key, that when it comes in contact with certain components on the cell surface, that's like inserting the key into the lock. And so it's using this master key basically to trick the cell into letting it in, uh, even though, so of course, it is detrimental for the cell to let the virus in. And then once it's in, each virus has its own set of instructions, the same as our cell has their own set of instructions for life, a virus has a set of instructions that uh, gives all the information necessary to make lots more copies of itself. And so we've all heard of computer viruses, of course, which can spread and copy themselves like crazy on your computer if you're not careful. The same thing is true for viruses that infect cells and that their goal uh, is to amplify lots and lots of copies of themselves and spread. And so that set of instructions that they deposit into the cell tells them or tells the cell how to do that. And so they're, they're able to use those instructions and the, the things that are made with those instructions to then steal uh, the, the uh, machines that are in a cell that will make lots more copies of the virus and let it out basically. So how does it even become an existence? Like how, how does the virus become a virus if that, how is it born? And then also this question of it moving from an, animals where we think that it, it, was, it was created in animals and then how does it move over to people? So those two things are confusing, I think. Yeah, I mean, how a virus comes into existence is a really almost an existential question. It's hard to answer They're They're so ancient. So even if you just think about the viruses that my lab works on, the herpes viruses, which everybody has heard of, you know, to some extent, uh, one herpes virus or another. These are so ancient. They have been evolving for something like 200 million years. That's way longer than humans have been on the planet. So that means that, you know, over long periods of evolutionary time, these come into existence and we don't truly know how they come into existence, but they are, everywhere. Um, viruses are, are, are everywhere, basically. And so really the question, the second part of your question is one that I think people have a better handle on, which is this phenomenon of, well, how does a virus all of a sudden jump into the human population? We didn't have coronavirus too before last fall. And so where did it come from? How did it get there? And that's something that many scientists are, are actively studying. And it involves the the observation that we have tons of viruses in us, but animals have tons of viruses in them too. And bats in particular harbor many different types of viruses that tend to be really dangerous when they get into humans. Ebola viruses and um, Nipah viruses and, and these viruses that cause these terrible hemorrhagic diseases and also coronaviruses. There are probably thousands of coronaviruses that are circulating in bats, most of which are adapted to replicate in bats, but are not well adapted to get into humans. And that's because that lock and key mechanism that I was telling you about, their, their key doesn't fit the human cell lock, it fits the bat cell lock. And so you have to make the virus, something has to happen to that virus, some changes or mutations, we would say, have to happen to that virus. And it's a completely random process that, that allow it to, we would say, spill over out of the bat population and into humans. And sometimes that happens directly. So if somebody comes in contact with a bat, but that can also happen through a series of intermediate steps where maybe a virus is in a bat and then infects um, a dog or you know a pangolin people are talking about for this one or um, a primate or something else. And it's through sort of these iterative species jumps that the virus gradually acquires mutations. It's not a directed process, it's a random process. Uh, and it's probably a rare event, but given how many of them there are around, you know, you can have what are called these spillover um, occurrences. And so that's what's happened for this pandemic, is that a virus that scientists are pretty sure started in a bat moved 
through maybe other species or directly came in contact with the human population and had just the right number of changes that allowed it to get into our cells and start copying. So interesting. This is all new information for me. So I'm sure for many others out there watching, um, that's, that's so interesting. So just a question about the bats. Do the bats get sick like humans would get sick? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. <laughs> and it turns out that um, in some cases, they may not. So there might be something unusual or special about the bat's immune system. And there are scientists who are looking into this as well to figure out how is it that they can tolerate these viruses that when they get into humans are really devastating. So maybe there's something different about how the bat's immune system works than our immune system works. And that, that's a really exciting area of research right now. Cool. So I want to wrap up with sort of some more maybe questions in terms of if you wanted to explain something to the public, maybe in terms of public misconception, um, mm -hmm. what would one thing that you would like the public to know that maybe you think there is a misconception about, or maybe you're getting calls from family and friends and you're this one thing you want to get straight, what would that be? Oh gosh, one thing I want to get straight. <laughs> <laughs> can I say two short things? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> Definitely. Please get, get, let's get everything straight. <laughs> we don't have enough hours in the day to get everything straight. <laughs> <laughs> the first, of course, is that there's a common misconception that something like antibiotics will work against viruses. So I think it's really important for the public to understand that an antibiotic will not work to cure a virus. That will only work against a bacteria because a bacteria is alive and they target bacteria, viruses are technically not alive and, and, and no antibiotic will work against a virus. So please don't ask your doctor to give you an antibiotic if you have a viral infection, that won't work. Um, the second thing is more of a, maybe it's a random you know, fact that I think is, is kind of interesting. And that is that um, most people think about viruses as always terrible things, is bad. And in fact, uh, there are more viruses on this planet than all other living things combined, including all of the bacteria. They are so numerous and the vast, vast majority of them cause us no harm whatsoever at all. And in fact, we've been able to use them to understand as sort of models to understand uh, health and disease in humans. There are, of course, a small tip of that iceberg of viruses that are really dangerous for humans. And when those get into the human population, of course, the consequences can be devastating as, um, as we're all living through right now. And so I think that's kind of something worth thinking about. Yeah, I hadn't thought about it in that way either, but that's a great segue into my next question, which is what are some things that you're hopeful for um, as it relates to this uh, pandemic and coronavirus in general? Yeah, well, I, like everyone else, am really hopeful that we are going to find a cure for this. And the cure in the context of antivirals that we can, that we, the medical community, um, using the royal we, of course, can uh, use to help individuals who are infected now or become infected in the future, as well as being able to generate vaccines to protect people from ever getting infected with this. And so um, my sense is that uh, there's so much collaborative effort going around all over the world right now where every scientist who has any sort of expertise in this area or the ability to help or is, you know, willing to learn to do this sort of thing. It's, it's an all hands on deck um, effort, which I think it's just really heartening to see um, everybody pulling together to try and solve, you know, a problem that is facing all of humanity right now. And then that on top of the amazing efforts from, from the, the frontline healthcare workers and everybody else who's volunteering and, and suffering because of this is, I think it's just a, it's a testament to human nature. Yes, I think so too. Well, thank you so much. It was so great to chat with you. I'm sure everyone will find this very helpful and educational and inspiring also. Mm -hmm.
So thank you again. Um, and just to everyone out there to learn more about Science at Cal programs. And if you have any questions that you'd like answered by one of our scientists on campus, you can submit them if you go to scienceatcal.berkeley.edu. Um, you can find a form there to do that. And again, to learn more about our programs. So I just wanted to say thank you one more time. So yeah, I appreciate being, being on. Yes, thank you. Bye everyone.